Well, let us turn in our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke and uh, chapter 7. <coughs> It is just over two weeks <clears throat> since the people of the United Kingdom expressed their opinion on who should govern uh, the country. But while our elect election campaign has uh, come to a close, uh, another one on the other side of the pond is just getting uh, going. Over the coming weeks and months, uh, the two main candidates will be crisscrossing that vast country in an attempt to persuade people that they deserve uh, their vote. Over the coming weeks and months, the people's opinions and conclusions as to who should run their country will be formulating. And 2,000 years ago, a similar thing happened as Jesus made his way around first century Israel. Well, the people back then weren't forming an opinion as to who should govern their country. No, they were forming an opinion on a far more important subject than either president or prime minister. And that was an opinion on Jesus himself. And people, as people heard what he had to say, and as people watched some of the things he did, they were coming to their conclusions about Jesus. And Luke records what some of those conclusions were. You may just want to flick back a couple of pages. For example, in chapter 4, verse 28, we read that following his sermon in the synagogue, the people present, they had heard the greatest preacher that there ever was, but the people present were furious. In chapter 5, verse 21, Having witnessed the miraculous healing of a paralyzed man, we hear religious leaders accuse him of blasphemy. But in contrast to those people, there were others that Luke records who were coming to a more favorable conclusion concerning Jesus. For example, in chapter 4, verse 36, we read of people being amazed at his teaching. In chapter 5, verse 26, we read that the people were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things uh, today. Opinions and conclusions concerning Jesus were slowly but surely forming as you work your way through Luke's gospel. And as we read Luke's account many years later, our conclusions concerning Jesus ought also to be becoming clearer. And this passage we are considering this morning records a very important incident in that opinion-forming, conclusion-reaching process concerning this man, Jesus. I say that because it is an incident that reveals some very vitally important truths about Jesus. The first of those being in verses 11 to 13, and there we see the hope that Jesus offers in death. The hope that Jesus offers in death. Now, following the healing of the centurion servant in verses 1 to 10, uh, a miracle that occurred, by the way, in the town of Capernaum, uh, Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd of onlookers made their way to the town of Nain. Please note it doesn't have an R in it, and therefore it's not to be confused with the Scottish town of Nairn. Nain probably wasn't as nice as Nairn. That's a biased opinion, of course. But it did get better weather, I'm sure, as it was situated in the Middle East. And like most ancient Middle Eastern towns, it would have been surrounded by a wall uh, with a couple of gates at various points uh, through which you entered and left the city. And under normal circumstances, uh, the town gate was often the social hub of the whole place. Whereas people here in the past would have gathered together to chat at the town clock or in the town square. People there often gathered at the town gate. It was a convenient place for saying farewell to locals who were setting off on a journey. 
and it was a convenient place for saying hello uh, to visitors who were arriving at the town. But verse 12 tells us that as Jesus approached the town gate of Nain on this occasion, he was met by something exceptional, something much more daunting. Verse 12 says, as he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out. Someone from Nain has just died. And the custom in such places was to bury the same day. It was also the custom to carry the corpse on an open piece of wood called a beer rather than a closed coffin that we would use in this country. And it is on this open piece of wood that this dead man is being carried through the city gate and out to the place of burial. And although funerals are always sad occasions, this one was particularly sad because of what we are told in verse 12. And that is that the deceased man was the only son of a widow. Contrary to the political correctness of our society, uh, the male members of a family were considered to be particularly important in that society. It was the males within a family who were often the breadwinners. It was the males within a family who provided protection. And perhaps most importantly of all, it was the males who could ensure that the family name was carried on. And this death in Nain was particularly sad because the young man who's died, he's the only son of a woman who has already lost her husband. Do you see how tragic this woman's circumstances are? Having already lost her husband and having now lost her only son, this woman has no one to care for her, no one to provide for her, no one to protect her, no one to carry on the family name. If ever there was a sad funeral, this is it. And that is why verse 12 tells us that a large crowd from the town had come out to pay their respect and express their sympathy. If ever there was a tragic death, this is it. And it is this death that Jesus was confronted with as he approached the city of Nain. The question is, how will Jesus respond to this situation? Well, verse 13 tells us that when the Lord saw her, that is the grieving mother. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. Now, bearing in mind that the custom was to bury on the day of death, it was probably only a matter of hours since this young man has died. And therefore, this woman's grief would still have been very real and very raw. And so that being the case, would you have told her not to cry? When you attend a funeral and you meet family members who are grieving, what do you say to them? It's never easy. But of all the things you might say, you wouldn't dream of telling them not to cry, would you? Of course not, for the simple reason that it's perfectly natural to shed tears in such sad circumstances. Even Jesus himself, when he stood at the grave of a loved one, wept. And so if he himself cried on such occasions, why is he telling this woman not to cry? Was it because crying was unacceptable within that culture? Well, it is true that some cultures are less expressive of sorrow uh, and sadness than others, but this was not one of them, that's for sure. Apparently, some wealthier families within that culture hired professional mourners to heighten the sense of grief at a funeral. And so it's not for cultural reasons that Jesus tells her not to cry. 
Was he simply being cold and callous and thoughtless? If you read the previous chapters of Luke's Gospel, you'll see how Jesus responded to people in difficult and distressing circumstances. He came across people who were sick. He came across people who were paralysed. He came across people who were despised and marginalised within society. And what you find in each case is that Jesus was not indifferent to the difficult and distressing circumstances that those people found themselves in. Far from it. And likewise, on seeing this sad, sorrowful, mourning woman, Luke tells us that his heart went out to her. That indicates that Jesus was no cold, clinical, callous robot. Instead, he was a real man who felt for people in difficult and distressing circumstances. Rather than being cold, clinical, or callous, here is someone who has compassion. And is particularly compassionate towards people in need. And it was in his compassion. It was as his heart was going out to her. That he says to the grieving women. Don't cry. The only explanation as to why a thoughtful. Comforting, compassionate Jesus. Would say don't cry to a sad, sorrowful, grieving woman in such circumstances, such tragic circumstances. Is that he honestly believes that there is something that he can do to address this desperate situation. Jesus believes he can bring hope into this hopeless situation. The reason Jesus tells her not to cry is because he can offer hope even in the face of death. And the hope that he brought to this hopeless funeral back then is the very same hope that he can bring to a funeral today. As our society moves away from its uh, Christian culture and Christian moorings, funerals, as you may very well have noticed if you attend funerals, funerals are becoming far more varied than what they were in the past. Significant changes have taken place in the funerals of our country. Out has gone the singing of hymns. And in has come the music of every description under the sun. Out has gone the prayers. And in has come the moment of quiet reflection. Out has gone the Bible readings. And in has come the poetry. Out has gone the sermon. And then has come the tributes about the person who has died. Now hearing something about the person who has died can often be a good thing and a helpful thing in a funeral. But the problem with a funeral that consists of nothing other than tributes and poetry and music is that none of those things offer any hope concerning the future. Some years ago, I attended a service at the crematorium here in Bangor. It was one of the biggest funerals I ever attended, and it was one of the saddest. It was sad, not because the person had died under particularly tragic circumstances, but because there was nothing said, nothing, which gave us any grounds for hope in the face of death. And that is the difference that Jesus can bring to a funeral. That is the difference he brought to this funeral back here in Luke chapter 7. And that is the difference he can bring to a funeral today. He is someone who can bring hope to the hopelessness of such a situation. Just as he did that day in Nain. That is why he tells this woman to stop crying. And why, you may be thinking, why can he offer such hope? 
in the face of such tragic circumstances? Why can he offer such hope even in the face of that ultimate enemy, death itself? Well, that leads us to our second point this morning, and that is in verses 14 and 15. And there we see the power of Jesus over death. The power of Jesus over death. And as I said a few minutes ago, the only reason Jesus can realistically tell this woman to stop crying is because he believes that he's able to do something which will radically change this desperate situation. And that is precisely what we see him doing in verse 14. Having said to the mother, don't cry, he then went up and touched the beer and those carrying it stood still. He then said, young man, and please note, <laughs> that is not one of the young men who's carrying the beer. That is the dead young man who's lying on the top of it. He says, young man, I say to you, get up. Earlier on, we agreed that we wouldn't dream of saying to a grieving family member at a funeral to stop crying. We agreed on that, didn't we? Well, I'm sure that if we wouldn't dream of doing that, then neither would we dream of saying to the person in the coffin, get up. If telling a family member to stop crying is thoughtless and callous, then telling a dead person to get up is absolutely pointless for the simple reason that dead people simply don't get up. Well, perhaps I should qualify that by saying they haven't got up at any funeral that you or I have attended. But did you hear what happened at this funeral? Jesus said, young man, get up. And we're told in verse 14, the dead man sat up and began to talk and Jesus gave him back to his mother. That is the power of Jesus over death. Since chapter 4, uh, Luke has been recording a number of miracles that Jesus did. For example, he cast out demons. He has healed sick people. He has cleansed a leopard. He has made a paralyzed man walk. And now he brings a dead man back to life. Please note, even when confronted with death, Jesus is not beat. Even when confronted with death, there is something that Jesus can do to help people. Even when confronted with death, Jesus has the power and the authority to bring about a change. And what we see displayed on this occasion is the power of Jesus even over death. But please note, it was a display of power which came at a cost. Not a cost to the mother, but a cost to Jesus himself. Did you notice how Jesus went about this miracle? Whereas the previous miracle was done at a distance and that Jesus healed the centurion's son without even visiting the centurion's house, this miracle was done at close quarters. Did you hear what Luke said in verse 14? Jesus went up and touched the coffin. Or as other translations have it, he went up and touched the beer. And what is the significance of that? Well, according to Old Testament law, Numbers 19, and within first century Israel, touching the coffin would have made Jesus religiously and ceremonially unclean. And that was a huge issue within that society. And yet in spite of those consequences, Jesus was prepared to identify with the young man in his death. That is what he's doing by touching the coffin. He's identifying with the young man in his death so that he might defeat death on behalf of the young man. 
on Jesus' identification with death on this occasion was pointing forward to a future occasion when Jesus would identify with death in a much greater way and in doing so would secure a much greater victory over death. Read on in Luke's Gospel. By the time you get to chapter 9, verse 51, you'll read of Jesus making his way up to Jerusalem. The rest of Luke's Gospel records that journey until he gets to Jerusalem and there he dies on a cross outside the city walls. And the reason Jesus died upon that cross outside Jerusalem was not because he deserved it, but because sinful people like you and me deserved it. As he hung upon that cross, he was putting himself in the sinner's place. He was suffering the sinner's death. He was experiencing the wrath and judgment of God that the sinner deserved. He was identifying himself with the sinner's death so that the sinner might one day know deliverance from death. Having died our death upon the cross... Having died the death that we deserve to die, Jesus is able to deliver from death all who put their faith and trust in him. And therefore, if you are trusting in Jesus Christ for your salvation this morning, then you too can look forward to a future resurrection of the dead. What happened on this occasion outside the gates of Nain is only a little glimpse. It's only a small foretaste of what will happen on a much bigger scale on a future day when Jesus returns to this earth. Just as this man was raised to life again, so everyone who has died trusting in Jesus will be raised to everlasting life on that future day. That is why Jesus can still bring hope to a funeral today. However sad the loss of the person may be, if the person has died trusting in Christ, then there is the sure and certain expectation that they will one day be raised to everlasting life. Amidst the natural sadness and the understandable sorrow of the occasion, the funeral of a Christian is characterized by a tremendous hope, a tremendous comfort, a tremendous certainty. That is the hope and the comfort and the certainty because the person has died trusting in the one who has the power over death. And therefore death does not have the last word. And therefore if you want your funeral to be characterised by hope, if you want your funeral to be characterised by certainty, then you need to make sure that you are trusting in this Jesus because it is this Jesus and this Jesus only who has power over death. Thirdly and finally, verses 16 and 17, the conclusion we come to uh, concerning Jesus, the conclusion we come to uh, regarding Jesus. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there were a mixture of responses to both the teaching of Jesus and the actions of Jesus. Some people were lining themselves up in opposition towards him, and while others were coming to more favourable conclusions about him. And it is the latter of those responses that is highlighted by Luke following the raising to life of this widow's son. Having seen the dead man sit up and having heard him talk, Luke tells us in verse 16, they were all filled with awe and praise God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. And why have they come to that conclusion concerning Jesus? Well, although this is the first record of someone being raised from the dead in Luke's gospel, it is not the first record of someone being raised from the dead 
in Israel's history. Don't forget these people were Jews and as such they would have been familiar with Old Testament history and on at least two occasions throughout their history there were people brought back to life. At various times throughout Israel's history God had sent prophets to the people. Those were special messengers sent by God with a special message from God sent to accomplish God's work in this world. And amongst them were two men called Elijah and Elisha. And both of those men raised a young man to life. And interestingly, in the case of Elijah, it was a widow's son who was raised to life. And as Jewish, these Jewish people look back, they identified those periods of their history as times when God was working amongst his people in an obvious way. And they identified those two prophets as men through whom God was working in a particular way. And now that they have seen Jesus raise this young man to life, these people in then are beginning to make the connection with what has happened in their past history. They are coming to the conclusion that this Jesus is yet another great prophet who has come from God and his coming is an indication that God is doing something special amongst them. A great prophet has appeared amongst us, they said. God has come to help his people. In view of the power which Jesus has demonstrated over death, that is the conclusion they are coming to concerning Jesus. Now if you're familiar with the rest of Luke's Gospel, and if you're familiar with the rest of the New Testament, then you'll know that the conclusion these people have come to is not all that could be said about Jesus. Their conclusion is true, but it falls short of all that Jesus was and is. He was more than a prophet who had come from God. He is God who had come as man. That is what the Bible as a whole teaches concerning Jesus. But to give credit where credit is due, these people in Nain have at least responded favourably and they've at least responded responsibly to the revelation which they've been given about Jesus. In sharp contrast to certain other responses Luke has recorded, these people are not dismissing Jesus as a deceiver. These people are not dis dismissing Jesus as a blasphemer or as an irrelevance. No, instead they are acknowledging that this Jesus is someone special, someone who has come from God, someone who is doing God's work in this world. That is the conclusion they have come to about this Jesus in view of his power over death. And the big question this morning is, what conclusion will you and I come to about Jesus in view of his power over death? What conclusion will we come to? In view of what Jesus did on this and other occasions, can we realistically dismiss him as being nothing other than a first century con man? To heal someone from a distance as he did in the previous incident. To raise someone from the dead as he's done on this occasion would suggest that this was no con man. But rather here is someone whose claims to have come from God were backed up by demonstrations of power which belong to God. In view of what Jesus did on this occasion... Can we really afford to dismiss him as an irrelevance in the 21st century? If you ask people, what do you think of Jesus? You'll get all sorts of answers. Some people will tell you, well, he was a good man. He did a lot of good things. 
But we're 2,000 years on and life has changed. Life has moved on dramatically. And so surely he, he's no longer relevant in the 21st century, is he? As you know, many people's lives were affected the other day due to a global IT outage. Never heard of such a thing before. A software company released an update overnight and within hours thousands of flights all over the world were grounded. GP appointments in England had to be cancelled. People couldn't get their prescriptions and some people couldn't even check out their groceries at the supermarket. And all because of a computer update. It was an event which demonstrated just how much our lives have changed over the last few years, let alone the past 2,000 years. But although life today may be vastly different from what it was back then in Jesus' day, the one thing that hasn't changed from life in the town of Nain, the one thing that hasn't changed is death. Have you noticed that? 2,000 years on and people still die. We've got all the technology we could ever have imagined. We've put people on the moon. Our lives bear very little resemblance to the lives of people 2,000 years ago. And yet there is one constant recurring aspect of life. And that is death. If you go out towards Clandagai and stand on the outskirts of this town, it's not quite the city gate. But if you go out there, do you know what you'll encounter several times a day? Five or six days a week? You'll encounter exactly what Jesus encountered that day. And that is a funeral procession. Well, due to the invention of the hearse, it may appear to be a little bit more sophisticated than it was in Nain, but it's essentially no different today. Every day, every day there are grieving families making their way out of this town to bury their dead. The one thing that continues to dominate our headlines and continues to haunt our very existence on this planet, the one thing is death. And in view of that sobering fact, can we really afford to ignore someone who has demonstrated a power over death such as we have heard about today? Can we afford to dismiss him as being an irrelevance to our modern way of life when he is someone who can rescue us and deliver us from death. In view of the persistent presence of death in our world, in our society, and one day within our lives, surely this life-given, dead-raising Jesus continues to be extremely relevant for us today. And that's why it's important that you and I seriously consider the conclusions that we come to concerning this man, Jesus. Will we dismiss him as an irrelevance? Or will we trust him to be the sin-atoning saviour and the death-conquering Lord that we so much need? That we so much need in life. And that we so much need in death. Three things we learn from that occasion when Jesus met a dead son. 
Firstly, the hope that Jesus offers in death. Secondly, the power of Jesus over death. And thirdly, the conclusion we come to regarding Jesus.